All right, I think it's uh, time to get going. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name's Ian Scarrett, um, and I work at the, the Eclipse Foundation. Today we're happy to have Ian Craigs and Dave Locke from IBM and uh, uh, two project committers on the Eclipse uh, PAHO project to talk about uh, MQTT and PAHO. As many of you might know, MQTT is a protocol that's really well suited for M2M applications. And actually, I was just reading a, a blog recently where they, they made the claim that MQTT is the state-of-the-art protocol for the Internet of Things. So there's a lot of interest around MQTT, and so we're really happy to have uh, Ian and Dave here to introduce us to, to the protocol and the technology and the Eclipse PAHO project. This is actually a series of webinars that we've been running around M2M and the activities of uh, and technology of M2M that we're doing out of the Eclipse Foundation. Um, so we have one more webinar next in two weeks' time on on the Lua development language, and we've already done two webinars around the anatomy of an M2M application and just the general introduction to M2M. So um, there's uh, some great resources and, and content out there for for you if you're really trying to understand the space and get get better educated. But today, um, we have uh, Ian and, and Dave to talk about MQTT. The webinar will be recorded, and I will be sending out a, a link to the webinar in the next couple of days after the webinar is finished. Um, we also will have time to, for you to ask questions and answers at the, the end of the presentation. Um, so if you do have questions throughout, please uh, feel free to at, ask them on the chat, and um, Ian and Dave will, will take, take them at the end. So now I'd like to, to turn it over to, to Dave and Ian to introduce us to MQTT and the Eclipse PAHO project. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Ian, and uh, welcome, everyone. So as Ian said, we're going to uh, sort of do an introduction to MQTT today. Uh, and just before doing that, I'll just introduce myself and Ian. Um, so I'm Dave Locke. I work in IBM in the uh, United Kingdom. And for the last uh, 12 years, I sort of focused on how do we connect things from the edge of the network. And of course, connecting things from the edge of the network is exactly what MQTT is all about. I'll briefly hand over to Ian uh, to introduce himself. Thanks, Dave. Uh, my name's Ian Craigs, and I work at IBM. And uh, I've been working on MQTT for the past seven or eight years, principally in development and testing. Okay, thank you, Ian. So the agenda for today uh, is basically to give a brief introduction to the background to MQTT, what it is, and uh, why you might like to use it. Then we'll delve a little bit into uh, the API, giving a, a walkthrough of the Eclipse Java PAHO uh, client, uh, showing how simple it is to write uh, an MQTT uh, program. Um, and then I'll hand over to Ian, who's going to be a little bit daring and uh, do a live demonstration of some of the utilities that can be downloaded as part of, part of the Eclipse tooling, uh, and then go at one stage further and show a, a, simula a simulation tool that shows how to use MQTT uh, in a real-world scenario. Uh, and that will nicely lead us in, once we've showed you uh, how we can simulate TT in the real world, into showing some real-world examples that are out there deployed in the real world today, uh, and in some cases in massive scale. So without further ado, we'll dig into what is MQTT. Um, and just before going there, so last week we had a great presentation on uh, anatomy of an, of an m to m application. And uh, one of the, there, there are, of course, there are many, many aspects to uh, an M2M solution or uh, system. One of them is about how do we actually connect, get data from devices at the edge of the network or remote devices, how do we get that into somewhere where it can be useful? So typically into systems running in a data center. Um, so that's exactly where MQTT plays. It's all about how do we connect things from the edge of the network. And the way I tried to sum it up on this chart, I'll just read it out, is it's a lightweight event and message-oriented protocol allowing devices to asynchronously communicate efficiently across constrained networks to remote systems. And as we go through the charts, we'll delve into a number of those aspects. So for MQTT was invented about uh, 13 years ago now. 
Um, and it predominantly played in the machine-to-machine -machine space. So it was always about how do we connect in sensors, actuators, embedded controllers, gateway, real-time telemetry units. How do we get data from those devices out at the edge of the network into more central systems? And of course, to start with, that was more traditional back-end systems in the M2M -M space, SCADA systems, OSI Pi uh, logging systems, um, or more traditional enterprise systems like billing systems, maintenance systems, asset management systems. Um, uh, but as we've been working in this space over the uh, the last uh, few years, of course, the new world is not just the traditional processing systems, but we're now talking about big data, collecting massive, massive data, uh, data stores, because we're now seeing many, many more sensors and actuators and device types producing data. So we have to basically uh, get it into the center and use these more modern big data systems like Hadoop to store and process the data. And of course, that's brought into a new world a whole bunch of other back-end systems in the way of analytics, business analytics and intelligence. So we're not going to talk about how, how we process the data at the back-end today. We're really going to focus on about how do we get the data from the sensors at the edge of the network across, across constrained networks like satellite networks, mobile networks and the like into the systems and more important and just as important how do we get data events control events back to the uh, the devices at the edge of the network so that's predominantly where we started in the m2m -M space more recently of course there's a lot of devices that now sit out on these similar networks so we've got the smartphones the tablets the laptops that are wanting to connect in in similar ways to those devices uh, and they're even acting as sensors these days. So the phone as a sensor is a new paradigm. It can actually provide information into the system. But actually the more traditional way to think about those devices is we actually want to get the data and events out to those systems so you can visualize it and maybe respond to it. So you can see some patterns emerging here where we're getting data from the sensors, so that's sensing it, getting into the systems, providing it in traditional systems, doing analytics and prediction on it sending that data out, either the raw data to visualize it or the process data, we send alerts and notifications out to the mobile devices and they might even respond. So really MQTT is not just about the uh, the M2M the -M space, it's about connecting devices uh, and things at the edge of the network across networks which might have some constraints. And just to sort of set the background, I've got a chart here which is actually the very original design goals for MQTT back from I think it's about 1998 and actually many of these design goals hold true today. The scale might have changed uh, in terms of number of devices but actually the, the rationale and, and the design principles still hold true. So I'll try, I'll, I'll summarize what we've got on here. So it was really about connecting the physical world to the traditional IT systems. So that's often systems, the operation departments, which did not connect to the traditional enterprise systems. It was a way to start linking them together and getting this data into new areas so it can be processed in different ways. Of course, now it's much more than that because there's vast amounts of new types of sensors, actuators, devices coming on the market and we can actually directly connect those into, the, into these more traditional systems. But the two key design points that we had to cater for were the constraints on the network. So we're talking about networks which maybe have a low bandwidth, high latency, they may well be unreliable, fragile, so actually you, you might get a, a, a connection make and break on a regular basis or even occasionally, so we had to very much cater for those. And the other one, which was very, very important at the time, was the cost of the network. How much does it cost to send a byte of data across that network? Um, this is back in the days when we were using VSAT networks and it was exceedingly expensive to send data over those networks. A lot of people say, we don't need to worry about that today, but that actually isn't true. Um, there are many M2M scenarios where we're connecting large numbers of things, whether they're moving cars, smart meters, smart homes, uh, across a mobile network. Um, so we're talking large numbers of devices. Typically, uh, they, each device would get something like a one megabyte data plan a month. So 
they, they're limited data plans because it is actually very expensive to uh, data plans for M to M mobile uh, oriented network plan. So we need to base optimize how many bytes we send over the network. So we very much are about constraints of the network, and in addition, it's constraints of the device itself. Again, that has radically changed since we uh, we started MQTT. The original uh, uh, constraints were around typically 8-bit controllers with very limited RAM, 256 kilobytes. That ho that game has changed. Many of the embedded controllers and devices that we put MQTT on now are running Atom processors, low power, but still have gigahertz of uh, capability. And again, with memory, memory the price point has come down dramatically to the point where a lot of devices have a gigabyte of memory. So that's changed. Other constraints come into play like battery on mobile devices. Battery drain is very, very important. You want to maximize battery. Um, the other thing that was traditionally true in M2M -M systems of days gone by were there was direct coupling between devices and the processing system, the application that was processing that data to the point where nobody else could get access to that data and it was very hard hard to enhance the systems to provide new capabilities. So one of the key design goals was decoupling of the thing that was producing the data from the things that want to consume that data. Um, again, one thing that was a little uh, uh, different for, uh, for people that work in the enterprise sort of space is, is the number of things that we want to connect. So back in uh, 1998, we were talking systems that had 10,000 devices, sensors, actuators that wanted to connect. So that's dramatically different from a lot of enterprise systems where you're typically talking 100 or maybe 1,000. Of course, even now that 10,000 is very, very low. I've worked on a number of solutions where we're talking about connecting millions of devices. So that's in many spaces from telematics, so moving vehicles, uh, smart energy, so that's smart meters, smart homes. We're talking vast numbers. Um, and one of the other uh, sort of the key point was we wanted, because there were so many weird and wacky devices that we wanted to connect, there was no way that we could provide a small number of binary implementations of a client library. So it, the decision was made right up front with the uh, the companies that authored um, MQTT to make the protocol open so that it can be implemented by anybody that wants to do that. And as we'll see later on, there are many, many MQTT implementations. Oh, and the final point is it had to be simple and industry agnostic. We uh, did not want to have to worry about um, being what type of data was going across the network. We wanted it to be usable in many, many different solutions. So, okay, that's the sort of the background. Now we'll go into actually what MQTT specifically is. So MQTT is a messaging protocol and it implements the publish subscribe messaging paradigm or put in a nutshell one to many. So I can have uh, an application using an MQTT client library that publishes a message and it publishes it to a t on a topic. The topic is like the key or the subject of interest. Once that message is published, it, go, it, it goes into a broker or a server and you can actually then have consumers connect to that broker or server and express an interest in receiving messages on a given topic. So whenever a publisher publishes the message, it goes into the broker, one or more, sorry, zero, one or more consumers can express an interest in receiving messages on a given topic and when the broker receives that message it will push the messages to those consumers. So it's quite nice, if there are no consumers the message gets discarded, if there's one consumer or subscriber then that subscriber will be delivered the message, if there's a thousand consumers then all of those consumers will be delivered that message. So a typical example is I'm interested in the football scores of Saints versus Man United, maybe along with a bunch of other fans, so they would subscribe for football scores for the Saints versus Man United and but only one person sends the initial message but all of the people interested in that message will receive it. Publish Subscribe is implemented in many ways um, with some common features. So one of the common features is the namespace is always defined as a topic hierarchy. Um, and in the case of MQTT, the topic hierarchy is separate. We use a, a slash as a separator for the different subtopics. And I've got a simple example here, um, basically for sort of home monitoring and control. 
you can see the topic space is country, region within the country, town or city, postcode, house number, and then uh, various different uh, sets of information that can be published. So energy consumption, solar state, uh, sorry, solar energy generated, alarm state. Um, and I can also have the house interested in commands coming to it, so there's a thermostat set temperature. So that's setting the topic space is actually an important thing. Now, a, subscri a subscriber that wants to express an interest in messages coming from my house can do so in one of several ways. He can subscribe to an absolute topic, so he says, I want to subscribe to house number one in Hursley, uh, in Hans in the UK, and that's an example, the first example at the bottom, that's an absolute hard-coded uh, uh, subscription. But actually, a lot of the time, I'm interested in getting energy information, energy consumption, from a whole group of houses, uh, maybe from within the, 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 all, all the houses in Hursley. So MQTT allows you to use a wildcarding uh, construct to, uh, to subscribe to multiple different uh, subtopics. So there are two levels of wildcards, a single subtopic level wildcard and a multi-level wildcard. And two examples at the bottom. The first one, uh, with two pluses, two single-level wildcards, enables me to express an interest in receiving energy consumption information from all houses in Hursley. Uh, the last, ex last example, basically, is, a, is the multi-level wildcard, which has to be at the end of the topic. So here, I've expressed an interest in receiving energy consumption, solar and alarm information from all houses in the SO21 2JN uh, uh, zip code. So it's a nice way to basically uh, get information from either an absolute or from a multiple different uh, provi uh, providers. A couple of other uh, features of Publish Subscribe that MQTT implements is the concept of durable and non-durable subscriptions. A durable subscription says, okay, I'm going to make a subscription to the broker. Um, and if, so when I'm connected, if there are any matching messages, then the broker will give me those messages immediately. He will deliver those messages to me as a subscriber. If I disconnect from the broker, then actually the broker will store those messages on my behalf, and next time I connect, it will deliver those messages to me. So it's a store and forward mechanism uh, enabling you to, to, hand, uh, to store those messages when I am not connected. Whereas a non-durable subscription, only lasts the lifetime that the subscriber is connected to the broker. As soon as I disconnect, then the subscription is lost. And that's quite useful. Uh, bo both of them have their uses. Uh, one other nice feature that we have in, in the MQTT uh, Publish Subscribe system is the concept of a retained message. Normally in a PubSub system, if I subscribe to a topic, I will not receive any messages until a publisher creates a message and sends it on the topic that I, I have expressed an interest in. So I could be waiting a long time to receive a message if it's a slow moving uh, topic. One thing the publisher can do, he can actually mark the message as retained. And what that means is when it gets to the broker, the broker remembers the last known good message on a topic such that when a subscriber comes in, he will immediately be given that message, so he doesn't have to sit and wait. So that's actually a very useful way to store state, so the first time I get a subscription, I get the latest state on a given topic. MQTT, um, as we said, was very much designed to run on constrained networks and constrained systems. I won't go into the, the gory details, but just to give an example, the header on an MQTT message is the fixed header is two bytes, so it's very, very small. Um, it has some major benefits over HTTP, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on because we often get compared with HTTP. But one of the big feature, one of the big differences, is we push messages in both directions. So if there is a message to go from a producer into the broker, it is into the server that it is pushed from the broker. Sorry, from the um, producer to the server. And the one thing there's a big difference with HTTP. If there is a message to go to a subscriber, i.e. a client sitting at the edge of the network, then the broker pushes that message across the network. There is no polling whatsoever. So it's a, a nice mechanism for doing timely delivery of events, messages, and data between producers and consumers. 
typically there are two models of uh, working with MQTT. A lot of end-to-end -end solutions work in what we refer to as an always connected model. The device is always connected, so I can always send and receive messages to it. Um, some models, particularly in the mobile case, often work in a sometimes connected model where they will every now and then um, connect to the server, send a, a batch of info, uh, messages up, receive any messages that have been stored up there, and then disconnect. So it works uh, It works um, well in both of those models. But of course, if you want timely delivery, then the always connected model works very well because we can send notifications down to the device in near real time. One nice feature that we, we added, uh, that was added to TT, uh, was the concept of session awareness. A lot of the time in, in, in systems we've seen, you don't know if a device goes offline, and actually you might well like to know if a device goes offline. So there's a feature referred to as the last will and testament, which enables the server, when it sees a device disconnect abnormally, i.e. it didn't disconnect cleanly, the network breaks, the device breaks, then the server will publish a message on behalf of the device saying, help, this device is broken or there's a problem with the device, enabling other users to basically see that, maybe a maintenance department, and can then, they can then go and investigate why that device has gone offline. Uh, one of the questions from last week is, where does MQTT, what type of networks does it run over? Well, it typically it runs over TCP-based networks. Um, so over most mobile networks, whether it's GPRS, 2G, satellite, um, more modern uh, ways it's emerging is to run in a, a web socket, which of course, which for those who don't know, is the ability to take, take an HTTP socket and upgrade it to produce a bi-directional communication uh, mechanism between a web browser and a, a server. So one of the uh, w w one of the things going forward is uh, we're going to see, and we are seeing MQTT running over web sockets from web applications. Um, one of the other key points was we added multiple qualities of, qualities of service to for delivering messages um, to and from devices. Three qualities of service, there's the sort of the gold standard, we'll deliver the message once and only once. Um, of course, with that, there's a bit more overhead to actually meet that quality of service, so there are two others. There's, um, we'll deliver the message once, uh, so at least once, so you might get a duplicate. And actually, in a lot of cases, um, in, sen in the sensor world, they use the lowest quality of service, which is the message is delivered at most once. We refer to that as fire and forget. But one of the key points is we will meet that quality of service even if the network breaks or the connection breaks. When we reconnect, we will carry on from where we left off. Already talked about the constraints of the device. The, the, the client libraries are very, very small, uh, very frugal on battery consumption, even in an always connected model. Um, and actually, today, we run on pretty much any device you care to imagine. The, as I mentioned earlier, we made sure that the spe specification for MQTT was open and royalty free so that we can actually get many implementations of it. Um, and actually today we're talking about one of those in the implementations that are provided in Eclipse uh, in the PAHO projects. Um, it is, it's very much industry agnostic. Fundamentally, uh, an MQT packet is a series of bytes and we do not care what those bytes are. If you really want, you could be put XML in there. Typically, we don't recommend that on these constrained networks because you're paying for every byte. Uh, on the other hand, you can always go right the way down to bit level encoding, uh, which is what we see in a number of sort of mobile uh, M2M type uh, data plan projects. There are many, many implementations of uh, MQT clients and servers, all the way from full-blown enterprise scale servers that handle hundreds of thousands and millions of connections, all the way down to little uh, servers which are used within people's home for hobby projects. Um, and there's a full list of those on MQT.org. I'm going to talk about the API verbs in a minute, but it was very much designed to be simple to program to. Before briefly going, going into the API, um, just as a, a quick comparison of why you might use MQTT uh, versus HTTP, it's one of the most common questions we get. Um, HTTP is very, very good at what it does, particularly when it's used in sort of a RESTful pattern. 
Um, but MQTT actually has a, has a number of advantages, particularly in the M2M -M space and actually a number of mobile uh, use cases. So we've already talked about some of these. I'll just recall them out. So HTTP generally is you, you initiate the connection from an HTTP client going to a server, and I can push information from the client to the server. But if I want to get information from the server back down to my HTTP client, I have to request it from the server. And that's OK if you know the data's there. But if you've got events coming in and you don't know when the events are coming into that server, you actually have to poll the server. And polling is very expensive on the network and server CPU cycles. MQTT gets around that because once you've established a connection from an MQTT client to the server, it's opened a bi-directional pipe and we push messages in both directions, giving you near real-time low latency delivery of messages in both directions. Um, another good reason for using TT, particularly if you're paying for every byte of data, um, is the number of bytes we send it, uh, versus HTTP is dramatically lower. And there's a this is a pure example here from a particular telematics project that we worked on. And the calculation we did when we were doing the, the um, initial sort of proof of concept was with MQTT, every telematics device or moving vehicle, it was going to use approximately 137,000 bytes per device per month, whereas with HTTP, that was going to go up to 800,000 bytes. And when you actually uh, multiply that by the number of devices and the cost per device for the, the amount of data, that's a dramatic difference. Um, one of the other ones which isn't called out so strongly, but actually I think is important going forward, is the ability to meet delivery qualities of service, even across network breaks. I'll, there's a chart down there which I'm not going to talk about in detail. Um, there's a link in there and you'll be able to look at that afterwards, but it gives some examples of some comparisons of using MQT versus HTTP. For example, in the mobile case, we can deliver many, many more messages per second um, than HTTP, and actually, as a result, we get much better, sorry, and that actually means we get sort of back, better battery consumption per message and actually better overall battery consumption. So I'm now briefly going to go through and show the API. It is very, very simple. Um, there are a, a small number of verbs, and it was designed very much like HTTP to make it simple to create applications, but both simple applications and powerful applications uh, together. So the first thing you do with the, with the Java client in Paho is you instantiate a uh, MQTT client object and you tell it what server you're going to connect to. Here I'm specifying to use the TCP protocol. It could be SSL or TLS. Um, in other implementations have a local binding, so if the client's on the same box as the broker, it will use local. Um, it could be web sockets. Uh, it, there are many uh, different implementations out there. So you're basically specifying a URI, URL of the server you want to connect to, together with an identifier for the client. Here it's MQTT sub. One thing that is very important with MQTT is the client identifier that you use to connect must be unique in the server or the cluster of servers that you are connecting to. It is that identifier that is used as the key for durable subscription. So when I subscribe, if I go offline, the messages are stored under that client identifier. And in order to um, provide the reliable quality of service, we also enable you to specify optionally a persistent store on the client so that messages can be stored uh, when they're in flight to make sure we can meet that quality of service and there are implementations provided by default with the client. I can also specify, uh, once I've instantiated the client object, I can pass in additional options when I connect. So I can specify what's the keep alive. And the keep alive is basically how we use to detect where, if that connection breaks abnormally. The, 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 the more granular the keep alive, the, the, the quicker we're going to find out if a connection breaks. But of course, that's more bytes on the wire. And in addition, we can specify the last will and testament. So I'm said, if this client disconnects abnormally, ask the server to publish a message on the will topic with a content of something bad has happened. Um, and then anyone that's interested in that can, can, uh, can subscribe to the will topic. You can, there's many other parameters you can pass in, user ID, password, but this is just a flavor. And once you've set those options up, simple connect verb with the options, and hopefully you connect to the server. If not, you'll get an exception. Once I'm connected, I can now basically send and receive messages to do that. I 
to send a message, first thing I do is create an MQTT message. Um, remember, I mentioned earlier, as far as MQTT is concerned, everything we, uh, we deal with is bytes. So you have to encode, take whatever format you like, whether it's string, XML, you have to basically ensure that is encoded as a byte, uh, a series of bytes and handed into the MQTT message. I can specify on a per message basis what quality of service I want to deliver that. So here I specify quality of service to once and once only delivery and whether it is retained. So I've now got a message created. Um, in order to send it, I need to know what topic to send it to. So I get a topic object, um, in this case fruit great red, and on that topic object I can now send the message using the publish verb. In return, the publish doesn't basically isn't a synchronous operation. It runs asynchronously in the background. So the publish verb returns me a delivery token, um, which is which is the thing I can basically be used when I'm notified to say the message has been delivered to the server. And we'll see that on the next chart. A lot of the use of MQTT is using um, asynchronous callbacks. So here we've got three asynchronous callbacks. One of the ones I just mentioned is there's a delivery complete callback where the delivery token is passed in. So when that message has been delivered to the server, to the server, to its quality of service, a callback, a listener will be notified and you'll be given the token as the, uh, as the correlation um, to know that that message has been, delivery has been completed. There are two other methods on the callback. Connection loss, so if the connection breaks abnormally, I will be notified via the connection loss method and I can do uh, make decisions and ask, do I want to reconnect or what do I want to do? Typically reconnect and maybe resubscribe. And of course the other one is, when I subscribe, I don't know when messages are going to come. So actually it's the message callback and the message arrived method in the callback which is how I find out when a message that matches my subscription comes in. And that in, in there, I'll be told the topic um, and the message content. So I then process that message in that message arrived uh, callback. So, to, so, so now how do I actually express an interest in receiving messages? Very, very simple. I can do a simple subscribe, specifying a single topic. I can specify multiple topics um, in a single subscribe. Again, that optimizes um, the flows across the network. So putting, if I know I'm going to subscribe to two or more topics uh, up front, put it into a single subscribe, I'll minimize the bytes over the wire. And I can specify what's the maximum quality of service that I want messages delivered at. And of course, the opposite of uh, subscribe is unsubscribe. Just the mirror image, unsubscribe, and I can then specify one or multiple topics. And then just a few other little notes that go along with it. I talked about durable and non-durable subscriptions. Um, so there are two modes of operating an MQTT client. Uh, one mode, is, and that mode is set with this clean session flag. If it's set to false, then subscriptions are durable. The server remembers things when not connected so that when I connect, it carries on and we meet all the qualities of service. If I specify true, then that basically says, when I'm not connected, basically you, the server can clean up and forget everything about the client. Um, I th okay, that's all the key points in there. Oh, uh, uh, typical number one uh, mistake that everybody makes with uh, MQTT, they create two applications, a producing application, a subscribing application, and they use the same client identifier in both. Um, if you do that, as if you remember, I said every client has to have a unique identifier. If you connect two with the same identity, then the, if one's the, the, the second one that connects will force the first one to be disconnected. And if you have auto reconnect logic, you end up with a massive flip flop uh, problem. So something to bear in mind the first time you write an MQTT application. So I'm now going to hand over to Ian. As I said, Ian's going to do the daring part of the uh, the presentation with some live uh, some live examples of tooling. And Dave, this Dave, th this is Ian. Can you make yep. sure Ian takes your your microphone because he, Ian was very faint when he did the introduction. So okay, I'm just good. Okay, Ian. Uh, yeah. So Ian's microphone is very faint. So if you give me two ticks, I'm just going to hand over the headset to Ian. Okay, there we are. Is that clear? Yes, it is. Good. That's... Okay, 
I'm just going to run through an example with um, some examples with a few of the tools that are available. All of these are freely available both within either within PAHO or in um, other MQTT resources on the web which I'll mention in, in a little while. The first thing that we have is that we need a, an MQTT server to connect to. So we're running one in Eclipse at n2m.eclipse.org. It's running the uh, Mosquito open source MQTT broker. Uh, this is probably going to become the open source broker used in PAHO, but it isn't currently. So if you want to find out information about it right now, then go to mosquito.org. The um, It's running on a standard port, um, or you'll find the MQTT server uh, responding on a standard port. 1883 is an INA, INA, IANA standard port assigned to MQTT. Um, and it also has a, an 8883 port for encrypted SSL connections. As Dave mentioned previously, when you connect using MQTT, it's important that you don't that you avoid clashes with other users of the system. So the client IDs that you use to connect your applications should be as unique as you can make them. Uh, basically, it means avoid using simple ones. So I'm going to the first tool I'm going to show you is. Uh, in PAHO, and it's a GUI view of the functions that are available in the PAHO Java client, MQTT client. So this is using the Java client and just allows you to exercise the functions in that Java client from um, a, a nice GUI. So the first thing that we want to do is connect to this sandbox server. So I'm going to enter the uh, host name of the sandbox server, m2m.eclipse.org. I need a client ID which is going to be unique. So I don't think anybody else called Ian Craggs is going to be connecting at the moment. And that's all the information I need. So I can connect and I've, uh, by connecting the connect button, pressing the connect button, and I've successfully connected to the sandbox broker. Now if I want to register interest into a topic, which I have to do before I can receive any messages, then I have to uh, use subscribe, so I'm going to subscribe to Topic World, a classic twist on the old favorite, which means that when I go around to the publish screen and publish hello to Topic World, so you can see that this application has already filled in the topic that I used in the subscribe operation, so I, I didn't have to do that already, but what I'm doing now is publishing hello to the Topic World. And as I subscribe to that topic, world, then that, re that message is received. Dave mentioned wildcards. So if I unsubscribe to topic world, but subscribe to topic world slash hash, and then publish again to topic world, I'm also going to receive that, that message. Actually, did I do that? Uh, let me just check. Oops, uh, something seems to be, uh, <laughs> yeah. Dave did say this was steering. I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be uh, this steering. Let's try and connect again. I'm going to subscribe to world slash hash, publish to, ah, this is the reason. The application nicely filled in the topic. And this, this illustrates one of the features of, of MQGT. I can subscribe to topic, wildcard topics, but I can't publish to them. The application is nicely filled into the, top, the topic that I last subscribed to, but I need to take off that uh, hash because it's not going to allow me to publish to that wildcard topic. But what I can do is publish to world slash A, and I will receive that message, that message on that topic, or world slash B, and likewise I'll receive the, uh, the message on that topic. So any of the topics now that are published, any messages that are published to topic world slash anything else, I'll, I'll be receiving. I'm just going to show, move over to another application which is uh, freely available from, has been freely available from IBM for a, a number of years. So I can show that if I also connect that server from a different application, m2m.eclipse.org, connect, and uh, I'm using a client idea of Dave Locke in this case, which is uh, 
frank, fr frank, thankfully safe. And then I can also subscribe to world slash hash. And when I publish again using the Eclipse Paho client, then I both receive messages on the Eclipse Paho client and in the IA92 client. Dave mentioned retained messages, and what happens here is that if I, when I publish a message and flag it as retained, then that is going to be stored on that topic. So when the next client comes in and subscribes to that topic, the first thing they will get is the, uh, the last message that was published retained on that topic, the last go known good value, if you like. So I can publish to world, say it's a retained message, if I can spell retained, I've checked the retained flag, and now when I subscribe to Topic World from another client, any other client, then I receive that retained message that I just set. The last thing I want to show with these applications is the, a feature called the Last Will and Testament. This means that uh, when I connect and having set these options, if this client abnormally disconnects, so a normal disconnect means that you send the disconnect packet. If the network breaks, sometimes you want to know that your client application hasn't been able to clean up properly. So you can set a, a last will and testament option. And this means that if I go around to the place where I started this application and kill it, then I get the last will, and tell them, last will and testament message that was set for that client uh, is sent to all subscribers to the topic. And that can be very useful to tell you when something has gone wrong in your network and enable you to take remedial actions. So the other applications I'm going to show you oops. Uh, sorry, Dave is going to get me to the right uh, chart here. The other application I'm going to show you is one that's written by uh, a guy called Arlen Nipper, who's one of the inventors of MQTT, along with Andy Sanford Clark. Andy Sanford Clark works at IBM and worked at IBM at that point. Arlen Nipper worked in the industry, and one of the first applications they wanted to, uh, or solutions they wanted to create with MQTT, was the problem of monitoring the state of a pipeline was an oil pipeline that was traveling, that was connecting to remote locations. And so they have these sensors monitoring the state of that pipeline in the, in the middle of nowhere, and they, need, and they needed to get that data from those sensors uh, into a central data store so they could check on the, on the state of the pipeline along its, along its whole length. And if necessary, take actions to, to shut it down uh, if there were uh, problems detected. So. This tool that uh, Arlen has written is to simulate, give you an idea of how these sorts of solutions would work. So it has various components that you can simulate using MQTT to connect them all together. At the very bottom of the component level, we've got the sensors that deliver the actual data. So there's thermometers, pressure rate meters, flow rate meters, this sort of thing. They need a device to connect to, to enable an MQTT client to run on it, which can then connect to the central server. So we have devices which are embedded computers, like uh, um, the recent release, recently released Raspberry Pi, which has uh, 256K of memory and a very small form factor, the size of a cigarette packet, which you can, you can install almost anywhere. This sort of device can run an MQTT client, which then can connect via various um, networks, either wireless or wired to uh, a broker which then can, can communicate those messages to the, um, to the enterprise messaging system. So the idea of this application is that we can simulate this sort of network. It's called MQNAT and what I'm doing here is also running two uh, MQTT brokers in the background simply so I can see what's going on and control them more easily than a shared broker in the sky, which the Eclipse Sandbox broker is, and it's being used by other people. So this is running uh, an MQTT broker called Really Small Message Broker, which is also freely available. It's very similar to Mosquito, 
uh, and has been provided by IBM for the last five or six years. But if you want something that's open source, then uh, look at mosquito.org. So these two brokers are running on different ports. The first one is running on port 1883, the second one on port 1884. I have a broker configuration which is already set up, which is running to 1883, and I want to create a new one which also allows me to connect to the alternate broker, 1884. So I'm just going to press apply and that enables me to have two broker connections. That's enabling, enabling me to show what happens when one broker fails and the clients are able to reconnect to another, another broker as a backup. So I'm going to say that these clients are running on a Raspberry Pi, so I'm going to say call this a Raspberry Pi client. And uh, it's got a, a unique client ID, but of course I'm using my own brokers now, so I don't need to be quite so careful about that. If you were using your own uh, shared brokers, then you would need to be a lot more careful. I'm going to close that window and create uh, another client and I realize that we're short of time so I'm going to run through this quite quickly. Uh, hopefully this tool will be made available freely in the near future so that you'll be able to experiment with these sorts of configurations yourself. So I'm going to set 1884 as the, as the destination of the secondary broker and uh, press apply. And then I'm going to create, this This is set a modeled a client application and I'm going to model now the actual device it's going to be running on. So a Raspberry Pi is the name of the device. Again, let's spell it correctly. And I'm going to attach two devices, two sensors to it rather. One is going to be a thermometer and it's going to send temperature readings to a topic called temperature. It's going to be a triangle wave so it's going, and it's going to vary from 30 degrees Celsius to zero over a period of 10 seconds so that we can see some variation. And the second device that I'm going to, or instrument I'm going to um, set up is a thermostat which will send messages to a topic called temperature slash alert every five seconds using the square wave and it's going to vary between 0 and 1, which is modeling the behavior of a, of a typical thermostat where it's either on or off and tells you whether uh, you've got to a temperature where you, you need to um, take some action. It could be a maximum temperature of, of a boiler or um, some other temperature that you need to be aware of. And now I'm going to say to, in this simulation that this um, Raspberry Pi client is running on the Raspberry Pi device. And so when I start the simulation, these temperature um, feeds are going to send messages into the MQTT broker. And if I connect to the broker using the Eclipse Paho client, which is also running still in the background, then we'll see those messages coming in. So I need to disconnect from m2m.eclipse.org, change that to my local address, which is localhost connect and I can, because I'm using a local broker, I can subscribe to every message on there by saying subscribe to hash and this will display all the temperature met messages that are coming in. And given the time that we've got available, I think I should stop there and hand back to Dave. Thank you, Ian. So, one of the other things Ian was going to show, but we've run out of time, is actually uh, the tool enables you to actually now s scale up the simulation so that you can actually start simulating hundreds or thousands of different devices, which can be very useful for proof of concepts, for capacity planning, and for test purposes. And it very much marries up with the, uh, some of the uh, talk from last week from the anatomy of an M2M application, um, where they were talking about do, you might have a single sensor connected to a single purpose um, gateway, which then connects to a back-end system, or more as Ian has shown, you might have multiple sensors and instruments connected to a single device, and then that device will have a 
typically have a single MQTT client that is used to communicate information back from multiple different sensors and instruments across that single MQTT connection. And just before handing over to questions, I'd just like to very quickly show a couple of real-world um, App solutions that are using MQTT in anger, and one of those actually I, I don't know much about the implementation, but it's actually a very good example. Um, we sort of found out about it uh, just with a peer by searching the web. So Facebook Messenger uses MQTT for its communication, um, and from a blog entry uh, which I've sort of cut and paste here, they had an original implementation that was actually very poor. Uh, the, the latency of delivery of messages was very low, it was very uh, high. Sorry. The battery was draining very, very quickly, and of course, it, the, the user feedback wasn't particularly good. They found about MQTT being open. They took, uh, we believe, they took some open source implementations um, and have then dramatically, uh, uh, sorry, changed that, made it highly scalable, and that is now used in the uh, the Facebook Messenger application. And from the blog, it's put a uh, they basically called out why they chose MQTT and actually proven that it works well. So now. Basically, it works well with the bandwidth, the battery drain is good, and the delivery time for messages between Facebook Messenger users is very, very low. So they now get much better user satisfaction, and that's rolled out. Well, I don't know how many Facebook Messenger users, Messenger users there are, but I suspect there are many, many millions. So it's a really good example in the mobile space where uh, MQT is used. And the last one I will talk about is one in the M2M space, one of my favorites. It's an uh, smart home, smart intelligent, sorry, intelligent utility network. Got a company that's created a virtual power station, fully instrument people's homes. So it's not just doing smart metering. They're basically sensing information in the home, temperature, humidity, uh, current energy usage, energy usage of different devices. They can also control the devices. So the home uses, collects all that information up, uses a single MQTT connection from each home back to their virtual power plant, sends in monitor um, energy, temperature, and humidity every five minutes, and that's a lot of information when you've only got a one megabyte data plan, so it's bit level encoded, goes into the virtual power plant application, they go into the, uh, the analytics, and what they really want to do is make sure they're not going to run out of energy, or so they don't have to buy new energy on the spot market because that's expensive. And if need be, they can now send control commands down to people's homes to do things like lower the temperature, turn off the swimming pool pump. And what happens is they send down uh, uh, commands to a large number of houses where each command has a little impact on each home. So the homeowner owner doesn't know what's happening uh, or typically doesn't even realize there's a change going on. But because they've done it to a large number of homes, it has a large impact on the overall utilization of energy on the grid. Um, so that's actually a really, really nice usage of MQTT, but constraint, using constrained networks, minimizing what we send on the wire, and very timely delivery of messages. So with that, I'll basically hand back to Ian. Um, I'll, I'll briefly leave this chart up. It just shows a number of places where MQTT has been used. Uh, there's all sorts of weird and wacky applications from slot machines to monitoring cows, uh, point of sale systems, environmental monitoring, tra track side. Um, but, uh, and lots of people are using it in hobby projects. So it, it, it's, it's used in a wide variety of applications. All right. Well, th thank you, Dave. Um, so. Uh, there's still time for, for questions. Um, if you do have some questions, please uh, enter them in the chat. Um, actually, Dave just uh, pointed me for interest on the, uh, the Facebook um, case study uh, for MQTT. Um, according to Andy Piper, they're actually using it for the full app now, Facebook app, not just the Messenger. So um, uh, Facebook seems to be really uh, embracing MQTT. Um, so the, the first question is, um, what about security? Is anyone allowed to subscribe to any topic, like on Twitter, or is there a way to authenticate subscribers? And then the, the reverse of the second question is the same question, but the other way around. Is anyone allowed to post on a topic how, how a client can authenticate? Okay, so the MQTT specification uh, primarily talks about what flows between an MQTT client and an MQTT server. Uh, one of the things you can flow are credentials, you can flow a user ID and a password. 
Um, but because MQTT works on top of typically on top of a TCP-based network, the first thing we do in most in, in virtually all the uh, MQTT implementations that I've seen is to work on top of SSL and TLS connections. So that can provide you a number of things. It can provide you your network encryption, and it can provide you a de degree of trust. So if the server has a certificate, the client can trust the server. Um, and if you can get around the problem of the PKI problem of managing certificates on devices, then you can have a certificate on the device so that both ends can you can mutually authenticate. Generally, most systems I've seen don't do mutual authentication using SSL. They just use the typical web model where the server has a certificate, client trusts the server, creates an encrypted link, and then you flow additional information across on the MQT Connect packet. Um, that could be a user ID and password. It may well be a unique identifier of the device, an IMEI for a mobile phone, a MAC address, something like that. Again, in most servers I've seen, um, that then can be passed into an authentication subsystem. MQTT doesn't say anything about how you do the authentication. It specifies what flows over the wire. So it's really a facet of the server implementation about how they do the authentication. Um, one example, one of the IBM servers uses a JAS, Java Authentication Authorization subsystem, where we basically hand off the job of actually doing the authentication to JAS, and that can use LDAP operating system or anything else. Um, so that really, the, the, the way authentication happens, and actually, the, the question which was you alluded to, Ian, um, the authorization, I, who's allowed to publish on the topic, and who's allowed to subscribe to a topic, is actually server, that's a server impl implementation. So again, I, I can only talk for the ones I know about, so Webs for MQ, which is a highly scalable um, MQTT server, enables you to uh, uh, specify authorization on a per topic level, so who's allowed to publish on a topic and who's allowed to subscribe on a topic. Okay, so, so, so the next question is um, MQTT and Java ME, what's the main role for each one in the M2M space? Sorry, can you repeat that? Ian? So basically the question is, what's the difference between Java ME and MQTT? What's, what's, what are the roles for each in the M2M space? Uh, well, that, that, so they're two totally different things. So Java ME or Java Micro Edition is basically a small footprint Java runtime. So we've got J, Java Micro Edition, Java Standard Edition, and Java Enterprise Edition. So Java Micro Edition um, was designed basically in two form factors. One, to run on mobile phones. So a lot of the Symbian Nokia devices run a, a JME mid-P profile. Um, the second one is a CDC Foundation profile, which was designed for slightly bigger devices. Um, I must admit that was it was a, 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 there are a lot of people using that, particularly in the days of Symbian phones. Um, but I've not seen so much use of JME these days. A lot of systems like Android devices are run as standard Java runtime. So, so maybe ma ma is yep. So say maybe a different way. Can you use Java ME and MQTT together? So could you use uh, an MQTT Java client running on Java ME? Ah, uh, okay. So um, the Paho client that we talked about, the one that is on Paho, today doesn't support Java Micro Edition. There are other Java clients that do support Java Micro Edition, including MidP. Uh, and one of the we've had that question on Paho, um, and I'm st we're still discussing whether actually it's a value to do that, given there are there seems to be a very limited set of people using MidP and Java Micro Edition these days. Okay, so let's um, let's go. appreciate input on that. Yeah, let's go on to the next one. So, can you describe the the relationships difference between Paho and MQTT? Okay, so MQTT, uh, it, it, the specification is a, a description of how you f you implement MQTT. I what flows over the wire. You, uh, in order to implement that specification, you have to have Java MQTT. Sorry, you have to have MQTT clients and MQTT servers. What, we've, what is in Eclipse Paho project are a number of MQTT client implementations. There's a Java MQTT client implementation, a C client implementation, and a Lua client implementation from a, 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 a contributor called Andy Galmi in Australia. Um, there are many, many other MQTT client implementations. They're all linked. Um, if you go to the mqtt.org site, there's a full list of MQTT client implementations. In addition, of course, for an MQTT client library, you've got to have a server for it to talk to. 
Again, if you go to the MQT org site, there's a full list of servers right the way through from small footprint servers like Mosquito and RSMB that Ian mentioned, all the way up through up through um, big heavy lifting gear like the IBM MQ um, implementation that can handle 100,000 or more concurrently connected MQT clients, as well as a number of other servers like. Um, Active MQ has an implementation of MQTT now, Rabbit MQ, there's a whole host of them. They're all listed on the MQTT.org website. Actually, and that's a good point, that, that there's some really good resources out there for, for if you want more information, and the MQTT.org website is, is an excellent resource. Um, the Cospajo is a great resource for the actual client implementations. So the next question, we've got quite a few here, so let's, uh, let's try and get through, through as many as possible. So the Paho Java API has a username and password as connection parameters. Does MQTT support authentication mechanisms? I think you might have alluded so, to I, okay, so I, I, I thought I, I did try to answer that one earlier. So MQTT, the specification says you can flow the user ID and password um, between the client and the server. How the authentication happens is a, uh, it's a feature of the MQTT server implementation. Okay. Um, it really is dependent on the implementation. Yeah, and, and Dave, just you know, some of these questions have been queued up, so they might have been asked before you answered them. So, um, so if okay. you think you've already answered them, let's just keep on. We'll just kind of keep going faster. How does MQTT ensure durability internally, especially when subscribers are disconnected? Okay, okay so the, uh, how, how are messages stored when a client is not connected, i.e. for a durable subscription? Um, so again, if we take traditional enterprise messaging systems like MQ or ActiveMQ, they uh, basically typically used in enterprise uh, environments where they're moving million dollar messages between uh, systems. So basically they, they already have very sophisticated mechanisms for storing messages in them uh, and, and to do it with high performance. Uh, so again, the way the messages are stored is very much uh, server implementation dependent. Um, so I, I, Mosquito I know stores messages. I don't actually know what it uses to store them. But basically, one of the features of MQT the specification, it says uh, what quality of service we have for delivering messages and what do we do with the messages that are queued up. Uh, and it basically specifies QS2 and QS1 are persistent messages and must be stored and delivered reliably. Okay. Um, next question. Are there client libraries for Python C and processing? If you have not heard of processing before. Yeah, but. And, uh, well, one of the interesting things uh, of working with MQTT and, uh, is there are so many weird and wacky devices, and more, uh, uh, more, more so, there are a vast variety of programming languages, yeah, a yeah. number of which I'd never come across. Lua was one of them uh, until they told me Angry Birds is invented in it. Um, but yeah, if, again, if you go to the MQTT.org website, there is a complete list of MQTT um, client implementations, and that very much includes Python, Jython. Delphi, uh, there are all sorts out there. And so, and processing seems it's the language that Arduino uses. So, thank you, Andy Pipers. Um, so, next one: Have you tried connecting to Bluetooth, Zigbee, and Connect devices? No. So, generally, MQTT is used uh, on TCP-based networks. Um, so that that includes things like web sockets. On 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 sensor area networks, sort of the the ones like Zigbee and the like, they're not really well suited to HTTP as a connect, uh, to MQTT as a connectionless. There is another uh, specification which uh, there are uh, not nowhere near as many implementations called MQTTS, MQTT for sensors, that is designed to run on more sensor area networks um, like Zigbee and and UDP, it, it, it's, it's a very constrained, uh, optimized version of MQTT for those type of networks. The, the MQTT I've talked about today is predominantly for getting the, either the device, the, the, the sensor itself, or in most cases, a gateway type box, which the device is the sensors the actuators connect to. It's normally for connecting that across a TCP type network to uh, a central system or a, a, a system running somebody's home. So in most cases, it's based on TCP networks. Okay, um, so I think we're going to take we're going to take three more, and then um, we'll we'll point people at another source for for questions, and so we can wrap this up because I know people are kind of have other things to to get to at the the top of the hour. So is the MQTT broker considered a single point of failure? How could you deal with that? 
Um, if you've only got a single broker, then yes, it could be deemed to be a single point of failure. One of the things, features that Ian was going to show in the, uh, in the simulation tool with his two brokers, and we didn't get time to, is that simulation tool shows how you fail over in the event of a failure. And a number of the production systems, the oil pipeline one that Ian mentioned, has four brokers running in parallel. Uh, and basically, they are all that it's running as an active active system so that if you lose connection to one broker it can immediately fail across to another one. All right. Um, will the MQTT WebSocket implementation be publicly available? Uh, that's absolutely the intention is to actually public um, to, to have that contributed to PAHO. And do you want to give a time frame? Uh, yeah, I'd hope it will be out there by the end of the year at the latest. Okay. Um, well, at, so, least, at, at least we'll have a, an incubator stage out there by the end of the year. It sounds like there's actually one available already in Mosquito, too. Um, uh, there is indeed, and we need to talk to uh, Mr. Mosquito to, uh, to make sure we bring things together there. Okay. And the last question um, we're going to take is, what about MQGT and one M2M initiative supporting um, at C standardization on M2M? Okay, so for folks that don't know, there's a relatively new sort of, uh, organization called one m 2 m which is actually all the telco standards bodies from around the world trying to get together to create a worldwide set of standards for the machine-to-machine -machine space. Um, so ver MQTT is very much in the mix for, uh, 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 for being chosen by 1M2M uh, in their set of M2M standards, but again, that's very early days. Uh, I, I wouldn't like to say whether it's going to be chosen, but it is in the mix. Okay. And there's actually, we'll just take this last one because it was the last one that hasn't been answered. Um, uh, when, when, when we use persistent message from a client device, who is this? who's disconnected, how long the message is waiting in temporary storage, how many messages can be in the device store. Okay, so the PAHO Java and, uh, um, and the C implementation, uh, basically the messages that are persisted there are the messages that are in flight. So if you remember, once we start sending a message, we're going to meet that quality of service. So we only persist messages uh, of, for ones that are currently in flight. If the network is not available, the clients as they exist today don't allow you to send new messages and then have them sent from the device up to the broker when you reconnect. The number of in-flight messages in the Java client um, by default is 10. Of course, being open source, you can get in and change that. Uh, one of the th there's a number of things we'd like to do with the, with the, um, the PAHO clients, and one of those is to add in a proper buffering capability so that we can actually send messages when there is no network connectivity. So that's on the, one of the big ones on the to-do list. The other ones on the to-do list, just to give people an example, is to actually make sure the uh, C client can work on devices like iOS and, do f um, and actually do some improvements to make the Java client work much better on Android, because of course Android is all non-blocking. All right, so I, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much, Dave and, and, and Ian. Um, lots of great great questions and, and a, I think a really great presentation and, and overview of MQTT. There, there's lots of interest. Um, and I think um, the exciting thing is lots of people are doing some very interesting applications with it. Yeah. So, uh, it's, and, um, the, and, and I'd like to say, Ian, there's a number of mailing lists, um, uh, yeah, was, mailing yeah. lists, Eclipse PAHO mailing lists and the like. Yeah, I was going to get to that. So if you do have questions, um, there's, uh, the, there's the further reading slide that we have up. Uh, so feel free to, to, to kind of uh, educate yourself on the resources there. Um, the PAHO project mailing list and forum, um, feel free to ask a question on there. I know um, uh, people like Andy Piper, who's a great evangelist for MQTT, follows Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, uh, feel free to ask a question using the MQTT hashtag, and Andy or myself or some other people will hopefully get back to you on that. Um, so there's lots of resources out there that, that pe people can use. Um, feel free to, to email my, myself directly. My email address is ian at eclipse.org. And um, we can um, certainly help, uh, I can certainly help connect you up to the right people. All right. Thank you very much again for, to, to Dave. Um, it's, it was a great, great um, webinar. And thank you, everyone. We have another uh, webinar in two weeks' time on the Lua development language. I will be sending um, the link to the recording and a link to the, the, the next webinar in uh, email in the next, next uh, couple of days. Thanks, everyone.